All right, so I initially planned on giving uh, my first impressions of the Sony uh, A7C. However, I got too busy, I took too long, and I've had the camera for uh, about a month now. And so I feel like it's a little bit too late to do an initial impressions. However, I'll share my thoughts so far of how it's been using this camera um, day to day uh, from the perspective of somebody who just switched away from Fuji uh, and is now using the Sony system um, full time. So full disclosure, this is not the first time I've used Sony. Um, I've had Sony, the Sony Alpha 7 when that first came out, the first one. Uh, I've also had the Sony a7 III uh, when that, I don't know. I had that camera for a while, and so uh, now I'm gonna switch to Fuji, and now I'm coming back to Sony, and I'll share my thoughts on how it's been using this um, A7C, and also some thoughts on, in general, the Sony versus Fujifilm ecosystem. So body and handling. Let's start off with some of the positive aspects of the body uh, and the handling for the Sony a7C. Uh, number one would be the weight. Uh, this is uh, lighter for sure than the a7 III. Um, it's not lighter than the Fujifilm X-Pro3 that I'm coming from. And if you wanna see more about that, go check out my video where I compare this camera, the X-Pro3 and the Leica M240 um, from weight and a handling and a size as a comparison or, um, you know, aspect so go check that out if you haven't seen that but yeah this is lighter than a7 III but not lighter than the Fujifilm X-Pro3 uh, but when I had the a7 III once I geared it up with the grips and the accessories that I needed and the lens like it, it, could, it was kind of a, a heavy camera especially to, to just sling around your shoulder and carry it with you all day and so um, I don't think this is significantly lighter that it would make it much easier to do that but it's trending in the right direction so it's worth mentioning um, uh, a bigger benefit, I think, of it, it of it being smaller and lighter is the fact that it doesn't have that EVF hump, right? Now that you've got the the rangefinder s kind of shooting uh, offset to the side here, uh, this fits into smaller bags easier now because you don't have to worry about the hump, right? So if you have a bag that's you know this wide, just this wide, the A7 III might have had a problem fitting in that with the hump. This one will fit in there just fine, and now you have to, all you have to worry about is the length of the lens. So um, that's something worth noting uh, that it fits into smaller bags easier as compared to the A7 III. Um, and it is definitely shorter, right, in height than the, um, even with this, this grip on the bottom, than the Fujifilm X-Pro3. So that's worth noting as well, as far as the body and handling. Um, and then last but not least, I would say that the, well, two things really, I already mentioned one was that, that EVF off to the side. I love shooting cameras that are, um, you know, oriented in this way um, because it just, for me, it just puts me a little bit more into the environment. I can keep my left eye open um, and more easily see things that are going to enter the frame or that I want to kind of focus and turn on to uh, versus if it was in the middle, it's just a little bit more obstructed. It's not a huge difference, right? But um, it is a difference worth noting. That's why I prefer to shoot rangefinder style bodies, but I will shoot bodies with the middle EVF hump as well. I'm not, um, you know, particular in the way that I don't use cameras that uh, that are that are oriented that way. But I do prefer this over those in general, particularly with you know more low key everyday shooting, just trying to discreetly capture moments. I like this over a bigger DSLR st uh, style hump, so a um, more SLR style hump too. So uh, that to me is a positive. And then lastly would be. Uh, for me at least, the articulating screen. Uh, if you've watched my review of the Fujifilm X-Pro3, you know that I was a fan of the way that camera had the hidden back panel LCD um, because I typically try to stray away from chimping and I like to protect my screen when I put it in bags, I don't like that to worry about it. And uh, when you are able to hide it away, it kind of encourages you to not chimp as much and stay in the moment uh, and just keep shooting. And um, I don't know, it's just something that it, it kind of, gives more of a feeling of like when I use my film, uh, I have a couple film cameras, when I use one of those, you know, you can't check the picture. So like, I like to stone it away and kind of treating it like that, uh, but still having the ability to review the image via the EVF. It's nice when you actually need it. Uh, and then of course, in between shoots, you can pop that out and actually view it on the back LCD. Uh, so that's a pro for me in the handling um, department. I like that aspect of it. Um, your mileage, of course, may vary. So, um, over to the negative parts of the uh, A7C um, and the handling is that the grip, uh, you know, the body 
uh, without any attachments. The grip is super shallow, right? I don't, I'm not sure if this will focus on that, but hopefully it does. And you'll see that it's a pretty shallow grip. I have to add an additional grip to it of some sort. This one in particular is a wooden grip that I picked up off of AliExpress for like 50 bucks or so. Um, I love the way this grip looks. I don't love the way it handles. Um, so without the grip, it's shallow and hard to handle this camera, particularly if you have, uh, you know, bigger, heavier lenses on it, which I try to avoid in general um, on this body. But if you do, it makes it harder to like just have a grip on, especially if you're holding it for longer periods of time. You just don't have a whole lot to hold on to. And of course, your pinky has nowhere to go. So I pick up this grip, number one, to give my pinky somewhere to go and also just to give myself a little bit more to hold on to uh, when it comes to the overall handling. So uh, the thing I don't like about this grip in particular is that the, it angles towards the camera and the lens, which is already a problem with Sony uh, cameras for me is that there's not enough room in between the lens and your fingers. So it angles towards it where I wish it angled away from it. And so I might just have uh, somebody make a, another wooden grip that I can just screw right into the bottom there and angle that away for the ergonomics that I prefer. Um, so that's why I don't like this particular add-on grip. Uh, another downside of the body itself from a handling perspective is that this uh, this little thumb bump on the back is just too small, it's too shallow. It doesn't really give you enough and it's not grippy enough for your finger to really uh, hold on to and bite there. So that's also another downside. So what I've done, if you haven't noticed already, is that I've added this um, thumb grip attachment that I pulled off of my Ricoh GR3 and it kind of works out perfectly in that it goes above you know where the dial is and just lines up with the silver part of the camera and gives my thumb somewhere to go and oppose my fingers as i grip you know around this grip um it just gives me more you know purchase on the camera so that i don't end up you know dropping it and and, and risk uh you know breaking anything so that, that's the negatives of the body. I've tried to address a couple of them with some add-on accessories, as you see, which is typical for me. I have to do that with almost every every camera I own um, because I have big hands. Uh, so um, it's not a deal breaker for me, but for others, it might be uh, for sure a deal breaker. Um, transitioning to what's not really handling, but kind of is in line of performance is the EVF. Uh, so the EVF for this camera was pretty controversial, I think, when it was first announced because of the specs. I don't have the specs in front of me. Um, this is not a technical review by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there are plenty of those if you want to see those and compare the numbers. Uh, I don't generally care about that, but I will share my experience using this EVF. Um, and overall, uh, up front, the EVF, it's, it's good and bad, right? And I'll explain in how it might work for you and it might not work for you and what you might wanna watch out for. So if you don't wear glasses or you wear, you know, contact lenses or something, um, to me, this EVF is just fine, right? I have no issues using this. Uh, it's clear enough and big enough for sure to compose images um, and to see your exposure and to even manually focus using focus peaking. Um, I don't have any issues with doing that at all. Uh, I, what I will say is that the small magnification of the small size right in, in, inside of that EVF is to me, it's not a big deal because some of the other bigger EVFs I've used, I actually have a hard time seeing all the way into the corners at all times, like seeing all four corners at, at all times. And so what that leads to for me is that um, you might, I might end up, you know, including something in the corner that I didn't catch because I couldn't quite see them all at the moment that I took that picture. And so when it's smaller, I can kind of see it all in front of me and it makes it easier for that, right? I know that might sound like turning a negative into a positive, but that's just my shooting experience with that EVF. I actually kind of prefer it to be smaller in the way that it is. I don't mind it at all. It's perfectly fine and serviceable for my needs personally. Now, if you do wear glasses, uh, you might want to try this one out in person first before you, you know, plop down money and order it online or something. Um, find a Best Buy, find your local camera shop, somewhere that carries this camera, and actually look through that viewfinder and make sure it's good for you. Because what I found in my experience when I do wear glasses, um, the edges are hard to see. They kind of get blurry. The viewfinder feels a little darker. Um, I think light will scatter and bounce around in there a little bit more because you're not able to put your eye right into that eye cup and block that light out like you can if you don't have glasses. So if you do wear glasses on a normal basis while you're taking pictures, 
definitely, definitely try this one out. I would not order without trying it out first because it is a good chance it might not work for you because if I wore glasses 100% of the time, this wouldn't work for me, but I don't. I usually wear contact lenses, so it's not an issue for me. Once again, your mileage may vary. One thing I forgot uh, a negative about the handling of this body is that you don't have um, as many control uh, dials and wheels on it, right? As many custom buttons either. Um, the custom buttons are not really too big of an issue to me. I wish I had maybe one more custom button because um, you've got the trash can, the air phone, um, the four, each direction in the four way can be customized and then you have the record button. Um, instead of the record button, I wish they had two different buttons up here like they do on the rest of the Alpha Series uh, bot A A7 Series bodies. Wish I had two buttons here and then I could put one as record if I wanted to, but I would set those to different things. Um, and yeah, I wish I had a front dial so I could have a front dial, a back dial, and a control wheel instead of just the back dial and control wheel. It, it just adds extra step for like, you know, for me for controlling eyes. So I got to hit the D pad and then I spin versus just being able to adjust on the fly in manual mode. So it really makes using manual mode a little more difficult as compared to something like a Fuji film camera or um, even other Alpha series bodies and um, or, uh, A7 series bodies. So that's one downside to the, to the body and the handling of this camera. But for me, it's not a deal breaker. It's just a minor annoyance that I kind of have to get used to if I want this more contact form factor. Hopefully on the next one, they fix that and they give us a little bit more control. Don't put a million custom buttons on this thing. Don't make it ridiculous. I uh, like how simple it is, but just add one more custom button and give us a front dial and I'll be cool with that. Um, moving on to the performance of this. When I say performance, I mean the speed and operation of the camera, the autofocus, things like that. Um, from an autofocus standpoint, this camera is amazing, right? It's very similar to the a7 III. I actually think it's a little bit better than what the a7 III, at least what I remember the a7 III could do, especially in video. And I know it has like eye autofocus in video or the a7 III, I don't believe did. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit better in that regard. But yeah, the real time tracking of this camera is amazing, right? Continuous autofocus is just very sticky it holds on to things right you can tweak the settings so that when things pass in front of it it stays on the subject right this is kind of similar to fuji those features at least but it's just to me like it's way better than fuji right now if you're not somebody who relies a lot on autofocus this is a this is a non-issue for you but i know for me it allows me to get to, to miss less shots really like and you know, I know some people will say, well, you just need to good, good, get good with your gear. If you can't get with Fuji, then what are you doing? But at the same time, um, that sounds good. But in practice, I've definitely missed, not a lot, but some key moments that I wanted to get where the camera just for a split second jumped to the background on my X-T3, um, jumped to the background and I missed, you know, like somebody sliding into second base or something, right? Um, and then it reacquired really quickly, but I'd already missed that moment that was the best frame that I could have got from that from that moment. And uh, there's really not much I could have done about that besides, I guess, learning a little bit more, of, you know, becoming one with that autofocus system and kind of learning what it would do in certain situations and then pre-planning for it. Whereas with the Sony autofocus system, like you don't really have to do that as much. As long as you get your initial settings down, it's probably gonna hold on to which exactly what you wanted to hold on to. And it just, you know, at times feels like black magic, honestly. Um, so it's just, you know, something you wanna keep in mind if you're comparing the two. If you're doing fast tracking autofocus sports, right, that require that, um, then I think that the Sony system is just better in general, because to me it has some of the best continuous autofocus around. I have not tried the new Canon RF system, so I can't speak on that or the Nikon Z system, but I have, I did previously shoot with the Nikon uh, D750 and a 5D Mark III, uh, even way before that. And um, to me, this is just the best thing around uh, that I've used. But once again, I haven't compared it to everything. But yeah, I say all that to say the autofocus is fantastic. It's phenomenal. Like it's so sticky and it's so, the continuous tracking is so good. I never bother with single, single uh, autofocus. Like it's just no point. I just use that all the time. And I might just adjust either the size of my initial tracking point or go to a wide zone or something like that. Um, but other than that, continuous autofocus tracking is amazing in this camera. Nothing else to be said. Um, on the downside of the performance, 
I find that the A7C is a kind of slow to start up. Um, when you first turn it on, it takes a second for the actual, you know, image to come on, you know, the viewfinder will kick and the image will come on. Then it takes uh, another second or two for the actual UI elements, right? And so the autofocus box, your remaining shots, your battery, all the things that are going around it, to, it'll take a couple seconds for that to come on as well. And so you, I find you, you, you might find yourself if you're going from completely off to, oh, there's a shot, turning it on and picking it up, right? You might find yourself waiting for a couple moments and you might miss that moment that you're trying to capture. Uh, for that reason, I try to typically, if I know I'm shooting, right, keep it on most times and I don't really turn it off to conserve battery. Um, and that's partially because the battery life is just so good and I'll get to that in a second. But um, yeah, the, the start time is not great. And let's see if I can, uh, if I can demonstrate that for you right now, right? If I can flip this around and let's see if we can get that. So if I turn that on, one, two, three, there's the image. I couldn't, I can't see. Okay, let's, I'm gonna run that back right here. So if I turn this on, one, two, three, now the UI is up there. So three, three and a half seconds for the UI to pop up. Um, so just keep that in mind. You could miss some moments if you're in a fast moving situation and you don't already have the camera on and waiting. Or if you have it on and waiting and if it went to standby, fell asleep and you hit the shutter to bring it back up, you might be waiting three, three and a half seconds. You might miss that moment. Um, one thing I did find though, and I haven't done extensive testing on this, but this turned out to be true at least the one or two times I've done it, is that when I went from completely off to on, once the image and the viewfinder came up, right? Even if the UI elements weren't visible, like the autofocus box in the middle wasn't visible, I could start tracking, I could start focusing, and it would, even without seeing it, it would, it would be, you know, it would start tracking, I could take pictures. So if you're really in, uh, you know, a dire situation where you need to do that, like you could just have faith and trust the camera, you know where your autofocus point is starting from, because always keep mine kind of in the middle. You can kind of start holding and tracking and taking those pictures before the UI even comes up. So that's just a little tip, you know, once again, my most famous phrase, your mileage may vary with that one, but that has worked for me uh, the couple times I've had to do it. So, um, so that covers the performance. Uh, let's move on to the, um, actually we'll, we'll, we'll stay on the battery real quick since I did mention that. So the battery life on this camera is great. You know, these Sony um, Z batteries just last a really long time. And it really takes me back to, um, the days of when I used to use DSLR cameras and you know, my, my camera battery would last forever. Uh, these are pretty much the same size and capacity as what those were back then. So we finally now, uh, at least whenever Sony did it and then Fuji did it with their X-T4 um, camera body, we're finally in a space where we don't really have to worry about battery life with mirrorless bodies, as long as you get one of these newer ones with these bigger bodies. I mean, with these bigger batteries. So. Um, the battery life on this thing is great. Uh, I really have no complaints there. Like I rarely have to charge it. I can shoot a few days, you know, you know, especially if I'm not spraying and praying or something like that at a sports game. I can shoot a few days with it without worrying and then just charge them up. I have a dual battery charger, charge them up um, and then we're good to go. So battery life is fantastic, especially when compared to the X-Pro3. Uh, the X-T3, mostly the X-T3 because the X-Pro3, I got good battery life out of that because once again, I'm not really chimping. I didn't, the back screen I rarely used. I mostly was within the OVF and the EVF. So I got pretty good battery life with that one. Uh, but even still, this one's better with battery life just because of physically the battery is huge, right? So I'm excited to see if Fuji can figure out a way to fit their new bigger battery into the smaller lineup of bodies that they have or if they'll reserve that for the X-T4 and X-H lineup or whatever the case may be moving forward. But if they can fit that big battery into all of those, I think it would really go a long way of helping Fuji um, kind of get over the whole mirrorless doesn't have good battery life thing that all the other manufacturers have kind of caught up on to move past with their bigger batteries. So hopefully they can figure that out. Moving on to, uh, in my opinion, what is the most important thing is the image quality. Uh, and I'll talk about stills image quality and I'll briefly touch on video image quality. I'm not a big video shooter, so I won't have much to say there, but um, on the stills image quality, I mean, this camera is a known commodity, right? They put the same sensor in here that they have in the a7 III essentially. Um, and I believe the same processor if I'm not mistaken, uh, but then slightly updated or different software, of course, um, since it's been a couple of years. 
But yeah, so it's a known commodity. If you really want to, you know, dive in depth with that, there's years of reviews and deep dive analysis that have been done on the sensor from the from the A7, um, the A7 III. So uh, you can do that. But from my quick standpoint, it's great. I've used it on the A7 III, so I knew what I was getting into. 24 megapixels, full frame sensor. Um, good sharpness, like good performance throughout the range, uh, the ISO range. Um, really nothing to complain about. Uh, the colors out of camera and raw, like to me, they're not as good as Fuji, but they're workable. And what I will say is from what I've seen online in comparisons, I don't have both to compare side by side right now, but they seem to have improved the color science uh, when it comes, or when compared to the A7 III. Definitely in video, right? In most um, color profiles in video, it seems that they've um, improved the color science. It looks a lot more natural now. And I think that they've also tweaked uh, how they do their exposure metering, particularly in video, because they now meter for faces and whatnot, um, whereas I don't think it was doing that as much before. So um, color science seems to be marginally improved, um, not enough to where I wouldn't dump one camera to jump to the other for it, but color science seems to be better, not as good as Fuji, but better than it was before. And um, sharpness is good. And the ISO range, I would say that I find myself in high ISO ranges that I can get maybe I would be more comfortable using images that are a stop or so um, higher in ISO when as compared to Fuji. So my 12,800 on on the Sony a7C is probably or feels pretty similar to the 6400 ISO on my X Pro 3. My 6400 ISO on this feels like 3200 on X Pro 3. And I'll say 3200 on this feels like maybe 2400 or whatever on the X Pro 3. But then anything below that, and I think it's a wash, like you won't really see a difference in, um, in noise. Uh, but yeah, not to say that the Fuji is bad. The Fuji is great and high, so, but I just find that the images are a little bit cleaner, a little bit more um, workable uh, at high so from this, which makes sense because, you know, physically it's a bigger sensor and all other things being equal, bigger is gonna be better there. Um, but we, as we know, all other things are not equal because I do find that Sony's, uh, Sony, I do find that Fuji's APS-C sensor, um, especially earlier on in the days were like matching a lot of full frame sensors, particularly Canon. Like I think the, the earlier Fuji APS-C sensors were better than Canon, like 5D Mark II, 5D Mark I for sure. Like, um, which is not a fair comparison because that one's super old, but definitely 5D Mark II and probably even 5D Mark III like Fuji stuff was better, even though the physically the sensor was smaller. But now I think these other full frame manufacturers have kind of caught up, um, even Canon with the with the R5 and R6 to where their high ISO performance is, is good as well. So um, it's gonna be hard, I think, for APS-C sensor, all other things being equal to beat them these days. But anyways, uh, I think you get, like, it's like I said, about a stop in the high ISOs and then anything below like, 3200 or so it's, it's pretty much a wash it doesn't really matter um, for video quality i think it's really good i think that the one thing that is missing that people seem to complain about is it doesn't have 4k 60 just like the a7 III didn't but to me i don't really care about that as much as long as it can shoot good 24p and it has uh you know like s and q slow motion if i need to um i'm fine right uh i'm not gonna shun 4k 60 but if it's not there it's not a deal breaker for me personally um because i don't shoot a lot of video but i think the video quality come out of this thing out of the uh, a7c looks really good especially with the uh, picture profiles and the color grading you could do after the fact i think it's amazing and in fact what i'll say is that i think in my you know un inexperienced opinion i think that the a7c is the best video quality you can get in sony that is isn't the a7s3 right anything it's the best in anything cheaper than the a7s3 in my opinion right of course the a7s3 the fx3 and the a1 are going to best it but if you don't want to spend multiple thousands of dollars like getting this body for 1500 or so uh especially used is like i think it's a killer deal as far as the video package goes because you get the great image quality really good uh like very much improved color science and good picture profiles, great dynamic range. And of course you get this, which makes, in my opinion, makes shooting video, uh, especially if you're doing it by yourself, a lot easier, right? Without the need for a monitor if you don't want to. So um, 
I think it's a great bargain when it comes to shooting video uh, in the Sony lineup, at least. So, um, you know, take that for what you will. Like I said, I don't have a ton of experience shooting video, but that's just my experience um, so far with it. The Sony ecosystem versus like the Fuji ecosystem, because I know this was a big uh, draw for me. When I first shot Sony, um, one thing that kind of pushed me away from them is that, you know, they were kind of getting started and getting their lens lineups together. And they had a lot of expensive lenses that I just couldn't afford at the time. And so I looked comparatively at the Fuji lineup, which I had shot previously before and saw that, oh, for the price of, you know, one Sony lens, uh, GM lens or whatever, I could probably buy three to four or five used Fuji lenses and have my whole kit done, right? I just didn't have money to buy any of the new lenses they were bringing out as great as they were, right? I just didn't have the money to do that. And so it just seemed like there was more bang for buck on the Fuji side. Uh, you flip that over to now, a few years later, and I feel like with the help of, for sure, with the help of third-party manufacturers, like we're now in a space where Sony, the Sony lens ecosystem has a lot to offer um, that, um, that's kind of hard to match, right? They have these manufacturers like Tamron and Samyang who are making stuff exclusively for that mount that are very affordable and light and compact and like there's very little compromise on. Um, then you throw Sigma into the mix and they, you know, they brought their huge lenses over, of course, but now they, they're making some i-series compact primes that are great. Sony's making their own Sony um, G primes, uh, the small compact series that are great too. Samyang's tiny series, like there's a lot more variety as far as if you want something that's light and compact to pair with this body, but still good image quality um, and good apertures that give you, you know, a lot of more creative freedom. Like there's a lot more to offer in the system now than there was previously. Um, and Fuji, uh, while their first party glass is phenomenal, it's great and a good value. Like I think that their hesitancy to let third party manufacturers in over the years have kind of hurt them. They've kind of opened that protocol up from what I've read to some of these other manufacturers now. But I mean, the Sony lineup already has a huge head start when it comes to that, right? Tamron has made trios of, of zoom lenses and these other manufacturers have made compact primes that are exclusive to the FE mount, right? You can't get them on any other mount, which I think is, is a big advantage when it comes to it because I just like to have choice. I like to have options and competition which drives prices down both in the used market and the new market and sony offers that in spades because they started off with their lens mount so early and they were not greedy in sharing that protocol out and letting these third party manufacturers take advantage of it so i think that's benefited them greatly because i know for me that's a big reason why i was coming back because there's just there's some really good lenses in the sony lineup that um, gives you great value for the money and there's just no equivalence on a lot of other lens mounts at this time at this at this moment in time I'm sure that'll change over time hopefully but um it's really hard to ignore and so for me I needed I wanted something that was better for video in my opinion I wanted something that was um, not better the video quality I don't think is better than the XC3 I think it's easier to get what I'm looking to get out of it though right particularly with this body with the articulating screen um and so I think it was easier to use for that and then of course like I said the autofocus system is for me is definitely better and that didn't matter for what I'm currently shooting um so when I when I looked at other systems and I know I needed that and I knew that the image quality was a known commodity and the lens selection was expanding and, and it's kind of crazy what you have there it just seemed like the right thing for me to do to to, to switch back over is it gonna make anything I create better? No, absolutely not. I'm just hoping to make certain things easier. And I'm hoping that, you know, just um, gives me the tools that I need to create what I wanna create, right? I could get it done with anything, I think, but I'm trying to make things a little bit more efficient, a little bit easier for me. So the camera I'm recording one just cut off after 30 minutes. Um, and I guess that's something I <laughs> should probably mention as, a, as far as a, a benefit from a video perspective on this is that you got unlimited recording. And to me, that's kind of huge um, because I imagine it sucks to be recording and then not realize that well, your camera stopped recording five minutes ago because you ran out of time, right? On your 30 minute clip. 
So that's definitely a big benefit of the A7C that I forgot to mention. But I don't know where it cut off before, but what I was saying was um, basically um, how I thought that the, the video capabilities of this camera and the body itself like made it easier for me to get the video I wanted and the autofocus makes it easier for me to get the images, the action shots that I want and um, the high ISO ability uh, also makes it easier for me to, to capture some quiet, more intimate moments without, you know, introducing artificial lighting or anything like that and kind of just, you know, not bruising that moment and being able to capture it as it, as it is um, in a clean way with, and be happy with the results. So all these things combined with the fact that the ecosystem is so robust, the used market is, is so robust and the lens selection is constantly expanding uh, with things that are exclusive to this lens mount. All these things, you know, weighed into my decision to switch off. Like I said, it's not going to make my photography better. Um, I don't think I will be able to capture better video than I could on the Fujifilm system. However, it, I hope that it just makes these things a little easier, more efficient for me, right? So um, that's why I switched oh, back over to, to Sony from Fuji. Um, but you know, and I'm not, I'm not recommending anyone else do that. Like switching, switching ecosystems is expensive and usually not smart to do um but i just thought it was the right thing to do as my needs changed and you know would it help me get what i need to get more efficiently more easily like it was the better thing for me to do um so that's pretty much that's pretty much it um one more thing i will say i forgot to mention that uh you know i know i i i brought up the grip for this and how i wish it was angled the other way and i want to change that so because of that most of these most of the time these days I find myself shooting with this small rig um, cage on it, which gives me just enough grip to where it kind of bumps out my hand this way, which gives me more um, more to hold on to. And then it gets somewhere for my pinky to go. I just wish that the pinky part wasn't so long. They expanded it so that you could open the battery door on this one. Whereas on, whereas on this one, they uh, put a little, a little, um, latch so that you can open the battery door without interfering but small rig decided which i think this is a more elegant solution but small rig decided to make it bigger and so i don't like how it stretches my pinky out compared to when i grip the regular grip on the rest of the camera but um other than that i think it, it kind of feels a little bit better than this one most of the time and it's smaller getting it into a bag um separately what i will say is um is i really wish you know, this, this is a vein and this is stupid, it doesn't really matter, but I really wish instead of these all black lenses, this Sony will come out with some um, some special edition uh, silver versions of these lenses um, so we could get a look that was similar to this. And like I said, this doesn't matter at all. Like this is just a, a all like, you know, aesthetics thing. It doesn't matter for taking pictures at all, but I really love the way this package looks with the silver lens on the silver body and if they would make like a special edition silver 35 millimeter 2.8 like that Zeiss or some of their G primes and silver or some of these other manufacturers would bring some silver versions. I would really appreciate that because um, I think silver lenses look good on silver bodies and they also look good on black bodies. You know, that kind of like a panda look. Um, so that's just a selfish like, you know, plea to these manufacturers. I know Fuji makes some silver version of their lenses and I think they look great. Um, but please put, make some silver lenses, somebody make some silver lenses for these things. Um, and I'll be even happier, but that's pretty much it. Um, I guess the clothes, like one thing I really like about the idea behind this compact, um, little body is that, you know, it's kind of akin or similar to where the Sony NEX line, the first mirrorless lineup started. This is the NEX 5T, so this is not even the smallest one they make. They made like a NEX 3 that's just ridiculously tiny. But um, these APS-C bodies at the time were like amazing um, technological feats, in my opinion, that they could fit something like that in a body this tiny, right? Um, and so the fact that they've kind of tried to come full circle at least a little bit and put the full frame sensor inside a Alpha 6000-esque type body is uh, pretty cool to me that they did that. Um, and hopefully the Mark II of this, of this camera body, you know, alleviates some of the issues I have with it. Um, but yeah, pretty much that's it. I think I've talked more than enough about this. Hopefully you enjoy hearing 
uh, my impressions of the A7C as a former Fujifilm shooter. And hopefully that's helpful to somebody who is considering going one way or the other. Um, I, like I said, I don't really advise you to switch. I just thought it might be interesting content to hear my thoughts as somebody who's you know very recently shot both. Hopefully you found it useful and hopefully you'll stick around for the next video I'll post. Um, and so until then, I'll see you in the next one.